Terry, I thought we'd begin tonight at a point, the beginning of chapter four, when you ask a question which I think all of us have asked recently, why are the most unlikely people, including myself, suddenly talking about God? We have all these books about God. The occasion of this book is a critique of several which you, and I have to say I agree, are not terribly good books. In some ways, silly books, although books that are getting a lot of play and making a lot of headways for a so-called revival of atheism in the United States. So I wanted to ask you, first of all, why you now write this book, and if you can go back a little ways, which you do at several points as you reflect on the, the younger Terry Eagleton, what is it along the way that has led you to the religious preoccupations you have right now, which lead you to take on this subject of God? Perhaps two, two reasons why uh, the impulse behind this book. Either one, sheer irritation at the gross theological ignorance and illiteracy of men like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins who would not tolerate that level of gross travesty and crude caricature in a first year student of theirs. But when it comes to theology, it is, they, that's as it were fair game. Mentioning Christopher Hitchens, I, I ought to confess that when he was a lowly Chris Hitchens 30 years ago at Oxford, he and I were members of the same Trotskyist organization and indeed, and indeed frequently leafleted car factories together and appeared on picket lines arm in arm in a touching and fraternal and sentimental way. But he has gone on to higher things. He has matured. He has accepted realism, the nature of this world, and I, I have been left you know, stuck, fixed in the groove of my adolescent beliefs, clinging to my leftism like a toddler to his blanket. You know. <laughs> so there's, um, the other reason, however, perhaps a more important reason, apart from sheer irritation, is that um, it seems to me that um, the, one, of the, one of the interesting answers to the question, why, why this debate now? Why has God reappeared on the historical stage after what one might have thought would be a well-earned retirement? You know, which having bitterly regretted he'd ever, he'd, he'd ever created a single particle of this awful bloody world, you know, he simply swanned off, you know, and took a good rest. Why has he suddenly with a certain indecent haste, been swept back into the limelight. Well, lots and lots of reasons, of course, but I think you might do worse than, say, 9-11. I mean, of course, the recent 9-11, not the previous 9-11. Yes, not 9-11-1971, the date on which the American government violently overthrew the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende of Chile and put in its place an odious puppet dictator who went on to kill far more people than were killed in the World Trade Center. It's strange to me that Americans don't talk about that. I, I don't hear that on television or read it in the newspapers. Um, so it's not that 9-11 I'm talking about. It's the latest, not, not as it were, your perpetrated 9-11, or 9-11 perpetrated on you. Um, I think that one of the most disreputable aspects of the so-called new atheism, and I, I, I don't mind people being atheists, you know, some of my best friends are atheists. You know. In fact, some of my best friends are Americans. <laughs> um, my wife, for example. And, and two of my five children. <laughs> which, as Samuel Beckett said about one of the two thieves on Calvary being saved, is a reasonable percentage. <laughs> I think that one of the most reputable aspects of, of the new atheism is the fact that it operates wittingly or not, in some cases wittingly, I think in the case of Hitchens, probably not so much in the case of Dawkins, I don't know about Harris and co., uh, as the sort of intellectual wing of the war on terror. Now, Dawkins, to do him... Justice very stoutly opposed the criminal and illegal adventure in Iraq, and I think feels the same about Afghanistan. Hitchens, of course, had no such compunction. But I think, you see, that there's emerging here a new and rather ugly cultural supremacism in the West, 
which is now uh, not like the old, you know, gong-ho imperial supremacism, but is a sort of liberal one. The very people who are supposed to be the guardians of the liberal flame, in my society at least, you know, the Salman Rushdies and Ian McEwans and Martin Amoses, the, the, the liberal literati are the ones who are most visceral and um, offensive and panic-stricken and indeed in some cases openly Islamophobic. Openly Islamophobic. The line between a critique of that hideous ideology which is radical Islam and a critique of the Islamic faith is constantly and deliberately, I think, crossed by these people again and again. I think that's a very worrying and ugly phenomenon, not least when, as I say, it's spearheaded by the very type you would have thought would not have panicked at the first attack. Yes, Liberalism is valuable insofar as it can retain its values under pressure, under pressure from ugly forms of illiberalism. So far, I think the story is not good in that respect. So there is Arnie, to come back to your point, I think there is a political context to the new atheism. I don't say there's a direct link, and it's not a conspiratorial matter, but I think that's one of the things that interests me in this remarkably cheap and extraordinarily attractive book that I wrote. 